Good evening, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Let's Talk About It. This is Susan Johnson, and I'm here today without my co-host, Dennis O'Brien, who is out doing great things this afternoon, and he'll be back for another show very shortly. But we do have a wonderful guest for everybody tonight. We have our Secretary of the State, Stephanie Thomas, and she's here to talk about her work and how she got to be the Secretary of the State. So I want to welcome you very much to the show, Stephanie. Thank you, Susan. Happy to be here, finally. Yeah. <laughs> We've been talking about this for a while. <laughs> yes, we have. I remember uh, when you uh, first got elected and we were serving in the House of Representatives together. And I said, hey, Stephanie, I think it would be great to have you come out to Wyndham and yeah. come on the Let's Talk About It show and uh, tell us all about your district. So why don't we start there uh, and just talk a little bit about when you were the state representative for your district and what towns did you represent? Sure. I was uh, covering the 143rd district, uh -huh. which are parts of Norwalk, Wilton, and Westport. So way downstate. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the other side of the Connecticut River and maybe some others that I'm not aware of. <laughs> but anyway. Exactly. Yeah. And so... But then uh, the Secretary of State position became open, and you decided to go for it. And uh, I was very impressed, by the way, with the way you spoke on the floor of the House, and you really had a lot of uh, great impact uh, when you were in the House, but you were there a short time. Yeah, absolutely. I was only there one term, so two years. Mm -hmm. Um, and when Secretary Merrill decided not to run for re-election, I thought, this job sounds like an ideal fit for me because I'm a business owner and the Secretary's office deals with biz uh, business formations. Yeah. Um, and I also care deeply about civic literacy and democracy and voting and voter access. So I decided to run, and here I am. Wonderful. <laughs> you, you ran, and my goodness, uh, you were able to do that statewide, which is a huge amount of work and so you are a business owner what kind of a business I run um, while well, I'm closing and in the process of closing it now because I have another full-time job <laughs> but um, for 10 years I've owned a fundraising consulting company that works with nonprofits on fundraising projects so uh, it's headquartered in New York City. We were working with about 30 um, nonprofit charities every year raising usually up to about 20 million Oh, well, I'd say that's a good amount of money. Yeah, <laughs> a lot of money to help good causes. Well, that's right. I mean, the nonprofits are doing uh, amazing work. A lot of the nonprofits, uh, of course, uh, were once uh, state uh, organizations, yeah. and they were privatized into the nonprofit sector. And I think a lot of people don't realize that. And I think a lot of people don't realize often if government isn't able to completely solve a problem. Um, nonprofits are usually there forming to pick up the pieces, so to speak. Um, so I always used to say, like, no one wants to see our society without the nonprofit sector. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's so true. Uh, you know, because that's what the government does and that's what the nonprofits do. They fill exactly. in the, uh, the things that the business community can't do, yeah. really. I mean, the mm -hmm. business community is there to make a profit, and the nonprofits and the government are there to do the things that the business community can't do. Absolutely. And so, and so tell me about um, what. But first, I know Secretary of State Merrill said she wasn't going to run again. Mm -hmm. And, of course, we want to just give her high praise, uh, great accolades for the amazing work she did. A hundred percent. Just amazing. Great work and, through the pandemic in particular. Yeah. yeah. And uh, also for the uh, way that we were able to finally get our Constitution amended for early voting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But we'll get on to that in a couple. I just want to get into some more of the things that you went through uh, when you were running for the Secretary of the State to get to the finish line and to make it here. Not that you couldn't have come anyway, but um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but tell us a little about the campaign and how that was. Because I know why, running statewide, I mean, I, I run just townwide, and it's just an amazing thing to me. But to run statewide is... Wow. I won't lie. It was a challenge. <laughs> so it helps to be committed, mm -hmm. right? Uh, most people don't realize. So I served two years in the State House, and now I'm Secretary of the State. That is my political experience. So it was definitely more challenging because I didn't have deep relationships with, you know, all the key stakeholders, town to town. So I had to do it the old-fashioned way. I think during the campaign I visited about 125 towns. 
um, at least once, some of them many more times than once. Um, we put about 13,000 miles on the car. <laughs> so just walking around, going around, introducing myself and um, answering questions. And that's what I did for over a year. And apparently it paid off. I guess so. <laughs> well, that's, I guess that's really the, the what you have to do. You're right. You really mm -hmm. have to be committed. And I just have to say how much I appreciate the fact that you were here for the Wyndham uh, Hospital nurses. Mm -hmm. You were here mm -hmm. for that, for supporting them. And, and when they were on strike and when they were trying to get a contract, you came out and you supported the nurses. Well, yeah, which was a really good thing. I think people, the nurses, are, I'm sure appreciated that. And I think maybe that goes back to some of your uh, your ideas in terms of how nonprofits work, how, just how we serve the public. Yeah, absolutely. I um, I have always been about people and mm -hmm. helping people. Um, so maybe it's public service, and that's what I felt I was doing in the nonprofit sector by raising money. And it wasn't until much more recently that I realized that government is serving in that same role, but you're just helping at a different point in the process. Um, so for me, listening to people's stories, telling people my own story, um, and really engaging at that person-to-person -person level mm -hmm. is really important to me, and I think it's important to voters. <laughs> oh, absolutely. So a little bit of the what we haven't hit on about your own story. Tell oh, us. Sure. Oh gosh, well how much time do you have, Susan? No. Um, so, so I'll give you my campaign um, speech because uh, it sums it up in about two minutes, one minute. Um, let's see, I grew up poor in an affluent town, which meant I had excellent public school education, but I often did my homework by candlelight because we had no electricity. <laughs> um, worked hard, went to NYU, I got a partial scholarship, worked my way through. Uh, my first job was in the nonprofit sector as a fundraiser, <laughs> and I decided early on that I would, um, I found value in doing that work versus just enhancing shareholder value, say. Um, so I got my master's in nonprofit management because I thought I'd open a nonprofit one day. But instead, while I was in graduate school, I got an internship for um, a consulting company. Mm -hmm. I worked my way up over a couple of decades to be company president. I ran that company for a little bit, and then eventually I opened my own company, um, and that's what I was doing. Um, so let's see, the 2016 presidential election happened and I decided to get more involved in my town. And that's when I realized how much happens in the governmental sector and how small a voice I felt that I had in it. Um, and the more I paid attention, um, I didn't like the way my state rep was voting. <laughs> so I was very audacious. I decided with no experience, no information, um, and very late in the process to run for that seat because no one had challenged her for several elections. And I thought, that's just not even a democracy. Like people should have choice. So I petitioned my way onto the ballot. I ran in 2018, I lost but only by a few hundred votes. Mm -hmm. And then, believe it or not, um, I thought, oh, I'm never gonna run again. I'm gonna go back to my company and <laughs> keep doing what I do. But one bill that I talked about throughout my entire 2018 campaign was the early voting bill. And I thought, we have a democratic trifecta. What else do we need? It's going to get passed and it'll all be wonderful. And it didn't, and that bothered me. So I literally said to myself, oh, well, I guess I have to get up there and see what's happening. <laughs> so I ran again in 2020. I won, and uh -huh. the rest is history. All right. Well, thank you for that <laughs> update. I appreciate it. That's great. Good to know. And uh, good to know about your passion because it aligns very well with uh, former Secretary of the State, Denise Barrels. Because mm -hmm. we had proposed early voting back, uh, I think it was 2010. And, uh, it's been and, a long time coming. And, 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 well, we proposed it, and as you know, the Constitution requires if you don't get a three-quarters majority, yeah. you got to go back and do the same thing over. Yeah. So we did. We got it done. Went on the ballot, and it didn't pass. The people here in Connecticut didn't pass it the first time. In 2014. But I really think it was a matter of two things. Mm -hmm. One, lack of any sort of public education campaign about mm -hmm. ballot measures. Mm -hmm. um, the reason I know that, 
Uh, I moved to Connecticut in 2013, so 2014 was sort of my first real election or big election. And I remember doing research, like um, wondering, would there be a ballot question? Who's on the ballot? And I couldn't find anything. Mm -hmm. And this was the first state I had lived in where I wasn't mailed a voter guide <laughs> that told you about all these issues. So I got to the polls. Lo and behold, there was a question. Mm -hmm. It was about no excuse absentee voting and early voting combined. Mm -hmm. And guess what I did, Susan? You would. I left it blank because I read it and I had no idea what they were talking about. Oh and I consider myself an educated person mm -hmm. and I did not want to vote on mm -hmm. something that I hadn't had time to research and consider the pros and cons, so I left it blank. Mm -hmm. And a lot of other people did as well. Yes, they did, yes. Yeah. Yeah, and it's been you know, a long, long period of time and then when a lot of the, a lot of uh, states don't have a constitutional amendment that uh, you know, addresses how we vote. Correct. Uh, and so, in some ways, I say that's good. In other ways, it's bad. Uh, the states that don't aren't required to uh, do the voting by the constitution. Uh, they can just change things by statute, depending yeah. on. Uh, you know how the legislature feels at that particular cycle, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and exactly. so you can really create a situation where you don't have that kind of stability that we have. And I, f I think in, in we have in terms of getting the information out. So it's just not a okay. We're going to do it now because the legislature said so. Mm -hmm. It mm -hmm. is something that the Constitution requires us to think about to make sure we really want to do it. So I think that when you take a look at how these things are in the Constitution, I always, as a lawyer, say, hey, you know, be careful of what you want to amend the Constitution for, because mm -hmm. if you want to change the amendment, it's going to take you some time. Uh, but on the other side of the coin, it also creates stability. And, you know, it is what it is, and I think it's fair that um, I, I actually prefer that it had to go to the voters for a decision. I just wish, as part of the process, there was education built in. Mm -hmm. um, but we saw that with the efforts of public education, there were a lot of groups from AARP, who seniors, by the way, really need early voting or enjoy it uh, when you look around the country. Groups like the ACLU, groups like Common Cause, League of Women Voters, they did do a public education campaign. Sec uh, former Secretary Merrill did as well. Yes. And we saw that when people were educated <laughs> about what the, they were voting on, it passed with over six, I think it was 60.2% mm -hmm. of the vote. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, but also they uh, did it on the heels of COVID, which also made people uh, really, uh, they were home more, so they got to read more. And, and they also uh, they also said, hey, I want to be able to vote by absentee or have yeah. early voting so I don't have to be in a crowd. If I'm an older person, I might be uh, subjected to some type of illness if I'm in close quarters with somebody who is maybe not wearing a mask, mm -hmm. maybe mm -hmm. is ill, maybe doesn't know they're ill. I think COVID was the public education campaign <laughs> because people learned, oh wait, people all around the country do many other things <laughs> other than going to the polls on election day. And I don't think Connecticut residents have really um, thought about that in mass. Um, you know, we're hardly an outlier. The first state passed, Texas was the first state with early voting back in the 1980s. <laughs> okay. We, we are now... <laughs> Along with all the gerrymandering that they did in the 1980s, too. Just want to say. <laughs> <laughs> but what I'm saying is this is a reform that has been around for decades. And we are uh, one of the last four states to just be getting to that point. And I don't know what Texas's uh, form of government was in terms of their, they could do it by statute, I would yeah. suspect. Um, I believe there were only, there's only one other state that had the constitutional um, requirement. And of course, then of course, we have our own details on how to make that amendment as well. Yeah. So, so I think that that is something that a lot of people said, well, what about Connecticut? What are you doing? And, and, and making sure, you know, you can't, all these other conservative states are, but I said, hey. You We're know. old. A <laughs> lot of our details are baked into our Constitution. <laughs> and, yeah, and like I say, some of those things need to be statutory. Yeah. And I think that we, we've done a good job with that. And now we want to do a no-excuse absentee ballot voting. 
Um, we do. So as you know, and thank you for that vote, um, that passed with pretty widespread bipartisan support. Um, no excuse absentee voting will now go to the public in the 2024 election for them to consider if they would like us to adopt it or consider it. Explain um, that too, would you please, because that is, that is something I think people fully get, that we have standards in the Constitution for which you have to meet in order to be able to get that abs application sure. for an absentee ballot to be sent to your house. In the state of Connecticut, you just don't get a ballot. You have to apply for it, and you have to be a registered voter. So I want to make sure people hear that loud and clear. Yes, and you have just <laughs> explained it, so I'll reiterate it. <laughs> Please um, go ahead. And, you can't say it enough. And, and, I, and I think, um, yeah, a lot of people are moving away from this term, no excuse, because it seems confusing. Um, some people call it universal voting. Um, some people call it no reason. Um, so many, many states, um, I believe all but 11 now, or maybe eight, have some form of what we have been calling no excuse absentee voting. It is no different than our current process, for example. States can decide how they want to implement it. Some states have moved to all mail, meaning they mail everybody either the ballot or the application, but Connecticut has never done that. We have an application system, and I would expect that to continue, where if someone wants an absentee ballot, they make that request, their town clerk checks their information to make sure it's a valid voter, um, and then sends them the ballot. So if they don't meet any of those thresholds, they don't get an absentee ballot. And now that you mentioned a valid voter, what constitutes a valid voter? Oh my gosh. Um, uh, I mean, I feel like that's a broad question, but a simple question. No, what's on the form? <laughs> yeah. What do you have to fill out in the form? What well, you, you have to be a registered voter. Well, no, I mean, uh, so how do you, you register? I guess, how do you vote? How do you register to vote? Um, uh, you can register either online um, if you have a driver's license, a Connecticut driver's license. Uh, because they already have a lot of the information that proved your citizenship. Um, otherwise, you fill out a voter registration form, hard copy, but same thing. You have to be a United States citizen, obviously. Um, you have to um, uh, provide some information, like your social security number, if you don't have a driver's license number, um, details like that, so your identity is verified. Mm -hmm. Very good. I just want to make sure because sometimes there's confusion about that. And we do have our um, our voter registration cards, I know, in Spanish and English. Are there any we other do. ways? Um, just those two languages. But I think what the confusion is about uh, usually is about who is on the list. And I don't think most people realize there are federal laws that mandate when someone can be removed from a list. So, for example, Say I get word, Susan Johnson no longer lives in Connecticut, and I get that information. If you didn't say that yourself by writing to your registrar, they then... Who does? No one does this. And this is exactly <laughs> the point. So please, if anyone is listening, when you move, please alert your registrar or voters. This would solve so many problems. But anyway, so you have now moved off to Wyoming. I don't know why, but you have. Um, and your neighbor told me that's not good enough. So the registrar now has to try to reach you. And they can't just try once. Um, so if it's not confirmed, it, it, so anyway, there are federal requirements with how many attempts have to be made. So there are many people on the list who are coded as inactive, but they're still on the list. And that's where I think people get confused, like, why is this person on the list? They haven't lived there. They're on the list because there are federal laws. <laughs> okay, well, that is, that's something I wasn't aware of. Yeah. So thank you for that. We're going to take a little break here. Um, I'm here with our Secretary of the State, Stephanie Thomas, and we, we want to have our sponsors get a chance to say hi to everybody, and we will be right back after these messages. Welcome back, everyone. This is Susan Johnson, and I am here this evening with our very, very special guest, uh, Secretary of the State, Stephanie Thomas. And we are talking about all the things that uh, you have to do in order to be a registered voter and all the uh, checks and balances that occur 
uh, on the local level, on the state level, and on the federal level. I just learned something new about the National Change of Address List <laughs> through the post office. <laughs> and so this is one way that the, that the uh, voters list can be updated after uh, two cycles of federal elections that people fail to vote in. So uh, that's a that's a very very interesting uh, interesting thing to to know. And now let's take a little bit of uh, talk about uh, when will we actually begin the early voting? Ah, oh, good question. Uh, so the bill that passed calls for the first election in 2024, uh, mm -hmm. which is the presidential preference primary in April. Wow. Um, and uh, you may, I'm sure you recall, since you got to vote on it, so the uh, PPP, as it's called, mm -hmm. um, will uh, include four days of early voting. Okay. But when we move to the fall, the August primary, or the general election in November, the primary will have seven days, and the general will have 14 days. Oh, yeah, I remember especially the 14 days. Yes. yes. Yeah. So that's where we are now, and I know that the municipalities have received some funding, but I'm not sure where we are with uh, if they're fully satisfied. So some funding was passed for the 2024 fiscal year, um, which covers the PPP election. Um, each town received 10, 000, or will receive $10,500 regardless of size. So they are not satisfied <laughs> because whether you're Union or Stamford, you got the exact same amount of money. Um, and nothing has been discussed yet for the next fiscal year, which will include the presidential election and the August primary where Senator Murphy is on the ballot and whoever else is involved in that race. So these tend to be high turnout elections. And right now there's zero money allocated. <laughs> um, uh, so I know our office will certainly be requesting a mid-year adjustment when the legislature reconvenes in 2024. Um, and I'm hopeful that dollars are passed to help towns defray the cost. Mm -hmm. Because um, for the general election, a presidential election, with the bill that passed, we're talking each town over 180 hours of early voting. So it's, mm. it's not cheap and it's not a small effort. No, 180 hours is oh quite a bit. It is quite a bit. Yeah, especially if you're a small town. I might note that I advocated for a smaller window, but... <laughs> I think how many people did. I don't think that you were the only one. I'm not sure why we went to 14, but I think a lot of people wanted it, and uh, so... I think it's one of those things. Um, I will say the average across the country is actually 18 days. Really? Um, so, and some states are doing 30 days, so I think... Um, if you're not tasked with implementation, right, it sounds reasonable, and it is reasonable, but it also will require quite a price tag um, because we need high-level poll workers, we need to recruit many more poll workers um, to cover those hours, and we'll be doing it for the first time. Um, so I'm hoping the state will provide a little bit of a safety net by defraying some of those costs for the towns mm -hmm. um, until we learn a little more. Yeah, what, 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 and in terms of, now we talked a little bit about the districts and the towns, uh, and so one of the things that we did discuss on the floor was the fact that it doesn't necessarily have to be the early voting place, it doesn't necessarily have to be in the town hall or in a voting place, it could be in a regular place that people go to on a regular basis, like a library? Um, maybe. Mm -hmm. um, most people are doing it in their town hall. Okay. Um, there will be some requirements. We are in the process of writing a handbook, um, so to speak. Great. Um, so the main thing that will have to be at the early voting site is access to mm -hmm. the central voter registration system, CVRS. Um, uh, so m every town, uh, are probably 99.9% .9 of the towns have that at their town hall. Mm -hmm. So if there is another location, hard lines will have to be run and a new system set up in that location. Um, and some money was passed to help towns defray that cost, but it wouldn't be enough for every town to do that. 
What about the equipment? I've heard a lot about the equipment and uh, how we are having to upgrade our voting equipment. So um, there's a lot of equipment that comes into play. Um, while we're talking about CVRS, um, what most people don't realize, right now there's no capacity to track if someone early voted. So we have to build out a new CVRS system, which happily we had already started. Um, and I won't get into too many details, but our new system, which will be fabulous, will be ready by the end of June, and we're cobbling together um, another new system to overlay on our current system that will be ready for the PPP election. And already people's eyes start to glaze over when I talk the about The presidential this. primary election. Yes. That is the PPP. Thank you. It's not the... Not uh, the Paycheck <laughs> Protection Program. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I know. As a business owner, that's what I think. That's exactly but, what I think <laughs> after COVID. Yeah. <laughs> but we're talking our, about our what was the other primary thing? Personal protection. Oh, yeah. Personal uh, protection. Yes. Uh, yeah. They, yeah, um, they, yeah. A lot of PPPs around. Yes, uh, <laughs> well, I guess there must be. A, so. I feel like there's a joke in there somewhere. There is. But but anyway, gonna go right I'm not going to go there. Um, <laughs> so the other equipment, not related to early voting, but just related to our elections, are our tabulators. Um, so anyone who's been around long enough remembers we used to have these great lever machines, <laughs> well, I'm which I old. loved, actually. I am curtain. that old, yeah. <laughs> and I remember my mother brought me in to vote when I was a little person. Yes, and yes. Every, always bring your child to vote. Yes, so absolutely. We, we, we have some of those old machines at our office, so you can come by and reminisce at any oh, time. Thank you, yes. but, um, <laughs> but we switched to optical scanners, which um, when we switched, we were also not exactly one of the first states to do so. Um, so the federal government became so concerned about states' voting apparatus mm -hmm. that they funded um, equipment. So that is when Connecticut purchased its last equipment, when we got that federal funding. Um, so we bought some in 20, uh, 2007 and 2008. And the way, I think one of my favorite registrars explained it this way. Like if you have an old car, it still drives, mm -hmm. but it's not going to match all the features and safety features of a new machine, a new car. So the same is true. Um, if anyone recalls headlines from last August, um, some of the roller wheels were melting because it was so hot during the August primary. Oh boy. Um, I know my first election, I, I didn't get my results election night because when it rains and the ballots get any kind of dampness, like imagine your sleeve drops some water. It doesn't always feed through, so it has to go to a manual count. It's like a printer um, wouldn't feed through. Exactly. You had a sticky piece of paper. And what most people don't realize, we have to feed our ballots that are voted by absentee through those machines one by one. Um, so Stanford, for example, in 2020 had 30,000 absentee ballots. So imagine that now, feeding through a cranky machine one by one, and people wonder why they don't get election results like on election night so quickly. Um, so we need new equipment. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and we're getting it? It's all in the process? Or how it was is that working? It was approved by the legislature, <laughs> yep, the bonding yep, committee. Yep, yep, so yep, yep. as you know, it still needs to be placed on the bonding commission agenda and then voted upon to uh, release the actual money. It was not on the last meeting's agenda. I remain hopeful that one day, very soon, it is, makes its way onto the agenda. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, we won't have enough time to implement before the presidential election, which is the goal, because of volume. Right, yes, the volume, and, and of course the machines are always uh, something that we, uh, back uh, and when uh, the Bush versus Gore uh, election, and we had the Help America Vote Act, and mm -hmm. we finally got mm -hmm. our first uh, scanning machines. Yeah, yeah. But our scanning machines have always been not connected to the internet. Yeah, they never have. And been. we've always had a paper trail here. Yes, yes. So this Connecticut's is great. <clears throat> Many states, when they got their scanners, they were the type that connected to the internet. Um, Connecticut has never done that. I suspect we never will do that. It's certainly, certainly, hope certainly not. not under uh, my administration. Yes. yes. Um, and now Homeland Security is very busy trying to make sure the other states are no longer doing that, and. Um, 
uh, saying that a paper valid and having that audit trail is best in class. I remember when that happened and I uh, I was going around with some other lawyers to some of the uh, mm -hmm. voting places just to make sure there was no difficulty, no question, and uh, I went through the Help America Vote training uh, just as a lawyer, yeah, just yeah, to, yeah. you know, just to be there for people who might run difficulty. And uh, that was uh, a big education, but because of that training, uh, Susan, uh, now Lieutenant Governor Bicewitz, mm -hmm. I was the Secretary of State then, and she mm -hmm. said, what do you think? And so all of us who were the Hava, Hava people uh, would say, hey, you're going to have a paper trail and you can't connect to the Internet, and that's exactly what she did. She yeah, was she was very right spot on, and uh, it's been maintained that way uh, all the way through. Yep. And it's really a good thing, and it makes uh, it makes it when you when you go to the to the well, here we only have 25,000 people, so when you go over to Stanford or mm -hmm. south, mm -hmm. uh, when you go to the southern part of our state, you have a much more densely populated area, and you have a lot more to deal with in terms of making sure that you count the vote and it gets over to the clerk's office mm -hmm. so the clerk can go and work on the tally. Exactly. So that would be, and also count the absentee applicant, the, the yes. ballots that actually have come in and exactly. uh, so they have a to lot do of that. work <laughs> on <laughs> election night. Oh my god. Yeah. I think it's more than most people realize. <laughs> yeah, if you go into the clerk's office after, you know, the election, which we do sometimes just to get the report on the absentee ballots, um, you know, you find out they're really busy trying to get it done. And uh, it's, it's a very, very difficult uh, It's very process. difficult, requires obviously great attention to detail. And they've been at that point working a very long day um, and many hours in mm -hmm. a month right. or two leading up to the election. So I always say mm -hmm. thank a election worker, poll worker, registrar, town clerk, whenever yes. you see them. <laughs> you see any opportunity I, uh, for the absentee uh, ballots can be counted, maybe have a little bit longer time to count them. I'm not, aside from well, the I, I will ask you, <laughs> that is a legislative uh, decision I mean, you're proposing it, I that would have to be made. Um, for the early voting bill, I did propose that they could start being count opened and counted starting when the polls open on election day. I think at least giving that much time is helpful. I do believe if we adopted no excuse absentee voting and we expect it to see large numbers like a town like Stamford with 30,000, you have to provide more time. Otherwise, mm -hmm. or you have to be comfortable not getting results Only for a couple 000? of days. Only 30,000? Only, yeah. That's a lot. Oh, well, we have 25 here. No, 30,000 absentee ballots. Oh, okay. <laughs> In okay. and of themselves, clear. Not, okay. not to mention the, the, all the other... Right, just 30,000 yeah. ballots, yeah. absentee yeah. Uh, yeah. ballots. Okay, that is, thank you for the clarification. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, a lot more voters. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I thought. <laughs> very, very good. All right, so we want to just, uh, you know, we're running down a little bit, but uh, so we, we're talking about the equipment. The Bonding Commission has that duty to try and bring that out mm -hmm. so that you can get the equipment. And then... Um, <clears throat> Uh, how do you, what do you think about municipal elections? So what do you think that uh, we have like a 21 to 32 uh, percent turnout in municipal elections and we're coming up on a municipal election this cycle. Mm -hmm. Why do you think that is? Honestly, I think it's about advertising and public education and I would be remiss if I didn't say that you know, I think most people just assume the Secretary of the State's office is out there informing people how to register to vote, how to fill out an absentee ballot, and providing, like, when the election's coming. But we're not, because we're not funded to do so. Um, we receive some um, uh, public education money with the ARPA dollars during the pandemic, and then the legislature did reappropriate that for the last biennium. But right now, um, we literally have zero dollars educated for any public education, whether it's in general, early voting, etc. Um, so what that means in general is that I believe municipal turnout is so low because no one advertises it. <laughs> During a presidential election, you cannot escape ads every day <laughs> about right. all the people running. So it's top of mind. In the state rep years, etc., Everyone is out door knocking. They're not advertising on television by and large, but there's a lot more um, 
activity. I know uh, my district was about 20,000 people. I probably knocked 6,000 doors. Mm -hmm. um, sure. And my opponent probably also knocked that many. So, you, well, you, But you also run with the governor or the president. As that's state, true. You're running every two years. That's so true. The that, governor, so you so know that there's an election coming so on. So there's just the law or talk. Yeah, and it's on TV. At, on and television. People, where people get their information. So during a municipal year, where, where do they there's get their information? no television coverage. And as we all know, the local media mm -hmm. is like disappearing. Well, ha, 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 no, we're on WILI, I know, we're a local I know. radio station, but, 1400 well, or 95.3 on your radio dial. And thank goodness. And we stream. But how many, <laughs> but how many towns have this? I mean, <clears throat> thank you. I mean, they yeah, don't. They that's don't. Right. That's I know, right. I know even when I first moved to Norwalk, mm -hmm. there were more local papers than there are now. So of course they're yeah. they're being bought up and they're being monopolized. So, uh, so I just don't yeah. think the public has it. Top they're of streaming, mind. right? They're streaming now. The public streaming their information. Uh, yes, yes. So you're yes, not going to unless correct, you go correct. for information on the government and elections. You're not, you're not gonna, gonna find it. You're not going to find it in uh, some type of a stream that you might be getting for music or movie yeah, or so a show. It's and not so on we're, TikTok. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe <laughs> we are on TikTok, but but I do think it's not top of mind. And then on top of that, I just think it's been. Um, for years, we just always talk about um, national politics. Yep. People watch national news. So although their tax rate, um, their zoning laws, you know, what their Board of Education is doing, these are things that touch everyone's lives locally. They think, oh, if I vote for the president, <laughs> it will have an impact. Or, like, it they, will, but, it not, will, not, but not, not, the the same not, way. not an immediate and, impact. And I just don't I think they make that connection. Yeah, I think it's partially more civics education, like you started yeah. to talk yeah. about. And we're running down to our last couple of minutes. Okay. I want you to say a few things about what we missed and uh, a sure. few things about what, where we're going. Well, first and foremost, thank you for having me. Mm -hmm. um, and I do want to thank the legislature because this was the first year in a long time where many voter access bills were heard and passed with bipartisan support, so thank you. Um, and civic literacy, this is my passion. Um, I think there is a bit of an American myth out there that if you vote, everything somehow magically works out. But that's just not how the process works. You do have to vote, but then you also have to stay engaged for the other 364 days a year. You have to let your state rep know what you're thinking, what's important to you. Um, when you are about to take a vote on something, it's helpful to hear from your constituents. It, you can't know every issue. You need that issue brought to you sometimes. So I just have been trying to prioritize teaching people about civic engagement and why it's important beyond just voting on election day. Um, I could say a lot more about that. But. Well, I think that that's, that's <laughs> a good start, and I think we're going to have to have you back. And uh, I know that now you're in the groove, so you got to get back here on WYLI and, and tell us some more about how things are going with the municipals and how we're going to start off with the PPP, presidential primary. Yeah. And can I, <laughs> give, yes, give, can I give one plug? Sure. Civics101.ct.gov. Yes. It's on our website. It's a great one sheet about the difference between municipal, state, and federal elections and what types of issues and positions relate to each. So read it. All right. And that's <laughs> going to be the next show, folks. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, Secretary of the State Stephanie Thomas. Thank you for being here. And we have another great show next week. So stay tuned. Uh, let's talk about it every Friday at 5.